Uh, maybe you'd get up if uh, someone comes in, but someone can sit on my chair that's got this bag there. Okay. Good morning uh, to uh, Ambassador Sh uh, Shalev and our Israeli friends, Boker Uh Thank you, uh, Director Goldstein and, and Chairman Rostow, for this wonderful opportunity to be here with such uh, distinguished experts and share a few thoughts. And I, and I tell you, I'm, I'm deeply humbled by the fact of, of where we are this morning uh, talking about this serious uh, topic uh, so near to ground zero. Having lived and studied in Israel as a, as a student back in 1979, I was thrilled the opportunity as Attorney General to, to take several missions uh, back to Israel uh, over the last several years. I uh, went there with the group uh, just, uh, just after the, the, Lebanon, the war with Lebanon uh, a few years ago. I saw the destruction done by deliberately attacking civilian areas and hospitals in northern Israel. Uh, so when Israel came under attack by the public, the international community, after its 2009 defensive cast lead operation, uh, I and a bipartisan group of other attorneys general uh, authored a letter to Secretary Clinton uh, as state attorneys general, kind of unique, getting involved in international affairs, but felt like as the legal officers of our state, we needed to have our voices heard. And we, we uh, indicated to her that our analysis was that, that there is clear legal authority for the state of Israel to defend itself under Article 51 of the United States Nations Charter. And that, and, and the VBAC was justified uh, and met the international requirements of any modern state that has a right to defend itself. Uh, there's a copy of that letter in the, in the material if you'd like to look at it. Now, earlier this year, I was back in Israel as Attorney General, and we had, uh, we were, we uh, went and met with uh, military attorneys, and they gave us the most incredible presentation showing us military video footage of the extraordinary steps they took during cast lead to protect the civilian population. As a, as a former naval JAG officer and a student of military history, I can tell you that nobody in the history of warfare has ever done more to try and warn, making phone calls into the homes of Hamas leaders, homes where there are caches of weapon, but calling them ahead of time and telling them they better get their families out. And when that call didn't get the families out, but instead had innocent civilians put back in that home as a result, and on top of the roof, to see Israel then still drop a little bomblet, a flashbang, to scare these people to try and get them out before they went after that cache of weapons. That is an extraordinary effort on the part of Israel to try and wage this war and defend themselves against the attacks. Now, at that time, my host uh, recommended I read that Goldstone report, and I went home and I read it. And I'll tell you what, I agree with, uh, with the Israeli, the IDF uh, Adjutant General, uh, Avakai Mandelblit, that said, when you read those other, all the other reports, and then you realize how truly vicious this Goldstone report is, he says, it, it, Mr. Goldstone made it look like we set out to go, set out to go after the economic infrastructure and target civilians. That was intentional. And that is a vicious lie. So where is the lie coming from? This is the topic we're talking about today. And it's nothing new. It's nothing new. Back in 1999, there were two Chinese Air Force strategists, Zhao uh, Lang and Wang Zhengshu, who suggested the manipulation of rules dear to larger nations as a weapon of war. 2,000 years ago, it was another Chinese strategist, one that's the, perhaps the greatest military strategist of all time, Sun Tzu in his Art of War, who, who said there are five key rules that every general has to know if they're to be successful. And first and foremost, number one rule, the moral law, which, quote, causes the people to be complete in complete accord with their ruler so they will follow him regardless of their lives, undismayed by any danger. He goes on, so in your deliberations, when seeking to determine the military conditions, let them first compare which of the two sovereigns is imbued with the moral law. And if it appears that the larger, more powerful enemy has the moral high ground, then you attack it. All warfare is based on deception, he said. Seizing something that is dear to your opponent, and then they will become amenable to your will. So what are these things that we in Western democracy hold most dear? I, as a lawyer, and I, I assume that, that everybody in this room value the rule of law and the legal profession Everything goes back to that. John Adams, of course, said that the, the Republican form of government is the best government because it is based on an empire of laws and not of men. 
Now, nearly, nearly a year ago, as uh, Ms. Goldstein pointed out, 10 years ago, excuse me, Air Force Major General Charles Dunlap said that lawfare is becoming a vehicle to exploit American values. He answered his own question in the affirmative when he said the rule of law is being hijacked into just another way of fighting to the detriment of humanitarian values. His conclusion is right, right out of the art of war. He said the exploitation of real, perceived, or even orchestrated incidents of law of war violations being employed as an unconventional means of confronting superior military powers. Nathaniel, uh, Nathaniel Burney has noted that lawfare tends to be used as a weapon against countries and societies where the rule of law is strong by guerrillas and terrorists who seek to affect public perception abroad and gain a moral advantage. Based on, quote, the fact that the citizens of rule of law countries, like all of our Western democracies in Israel, have a sense of justice and fair play that can be manipulated to achieve the enemy's ends. So what should be our response? I love your response. This is our game. Let's take it to him. Now, Bernie goes on to say, quote, a lawfare battle will be lost by ceding the ground to the enemy or by ignoring the other commonly understood principles of war, such as unity of effort. They want to divide us with these debates about whether our cause are just. He says that if you let the enemy control the terms of the message, you're losing. 